we're coming to your city. Gonna play our guitars and sing you a country song. We'll all be flying higher than a jetliner. And if you want a little bang in your yin yang, come along. Come on along and welcome aboard. Indiana Sports Beats rolling here on this Friday. It's August 14th. Thanks a lot for joining us. We appreciate you as always. Todd Leary is here as well. I'm Jim Coyle. Welcome in. We appreciate you. Alec Lasley from the Hoosier will join us today as well. Dana Bimbo from the Indy Star. Big show lined up as always. Plenty to talk about. Uh, the NCAA extends uh, the recruiting dead period, Todd Leary, which is not a surprise until October 1st. No surprise there. You can't do anything. You can't pay games. You sure as heck can't. Uh, recruit but uh I, again we there, there's a lot of guys out there that is basketball wise especially that are holding i hope that they can get the opportunity to to travel and make a visit to these schools and that's simply i just don't see that happening hell they're they're struggling to have students on campus right now they're not going to have visits anytime soon i don't think they're going to have visits to be honest with you i think that people like trey kaufman and and mason miller uh, those guys are going to have to make a decision via Zoom, for lack of a better word. But that I think that's as good as it's going to get for those guys. Yeah, and you know, like I said this to you earlier in the week, I I, I think that the visit is kind of an overstated issue when it comes to to actually someone committing somewhere. If they want to, if they want to go see a campus. I mean, when we talk about visits, we're talking about official visits. It's not as if Trey Kaufman's not allowed on the campus. It's not as if he's not allowed to go into the basketball offices and talk to the coaches. Well, we, the dead period's extended, so he can't do that. But he can go to the campus all he wants. He can go check it out. He can go check out the facilities. It's just they can't pay for him to come there. They, it can't be an official visit. He could have his AAU coach, his parents, a friend. He can drive, drive the car on his own. Like, he can go there. I'm using him as an example, but I mean, recruits can find a way to get to visit schools if they if they need to visit them. And Trey Kaufman has been to Indiana. He yeah, knows. I mean, he's been to Indiana. He's been to Purdue. He's now, it, but it's not the Trey Kaufmans as much as the Mason Millers. Those guys who are out of state. Who? Uh, 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 oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. That the the new Indiana target uh, that just Hopkins. decommitted from Louisville Hopkins, Hopkins that just decommitted. Uh, that's another one. You know, he's never he's got no indication. Uh, of the facilities, but, but at the end of the day, you know, if you're talking to an Indiana or a Kentucky or a Duke or a Michigan state, you know, they got great facilities. You don't care. It's stupid for you to worry about that. That's not an issue. Um, it, it's nice. Yeah, to get to go it, see that, it, that's but. true. That is true. I am everything you said, like the facilities are all pretty much probably close to new and state of the art. I mean, they're, they're awesome, but when you talk about like the the Oladipo Zeller, you know, lounge room that that Indiana has now, I mean that is <laughs> it's stuff it, you want to show off. It's stuff it you want to show off. You want to show off. You want recruits to see that. Now, yeah. it, you can show it in a Zoom call. You can you know you can let them see what it's like. But but it's always nice to touch something. It's more impressive in person, without a yeah. doubt. So yeah, there's some there's some some parts to that. But it, look, at the end of the day, the 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 dead period. I mean, if that if that means that that the coaches and, and staffs can't talk to the kids, that's a different story. But but I mean, if they can still contact them, you know, the the actual on site visits not as big a deal as you think it is. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree with that. I mean, you can get so much done through technology now. But then I now the next question is: it, Will this prompt commitments or will it? Yeah. Prompt holding on to yeah. them. Uh, that's the thing. Will it prompt guys to go ahead and say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get this out of the way? Or do they want to continue to wait and continue to hope that they get to do the visit? Uh, which that's I, – I, I'm not saying it's not going to come in the spring, but I right now I wouldn't count on anything as far as that. Um, I think Indiana may end up filling this class without having anybody visit. Yeah, and, and it's very possible. Um, however, you know, I, I also, you know, when it comes to, you know, th- football is a much different scenario. I mean, football, you, you can watch, you know, some of the big time basketball games at Assembly Hall and you'll see, you know, not one re- football recruit, but you'll see 12 football recruits in there, um, you know, that the coaching staff has brought in for that. Basketball is a little bit easier. You know, you're not bringing in 12 guys at one time. 
And and so, you know, I, I still think recruiting from a basketball perspective in college is eventually they're going to figure out way, a way to for these kids to be able to visit and be able to make commitments. Um, even if even if we don't get a vaccine, even if things don't change, even if they don't have a season, th- th- there'll there'll be some protocols in place where these kids have to, you know, wear masks and uh, all the normal stuff. I mean, if you could travel and stay in a hotel, there's really not a whole lot of reason why you can't visit a college. I agree. I agree. Uh, we'll see how that uh, affects guys like Trey Kaufman and Mason Miller and uh, Hopkins and all these guys to see what, what that does. So, uh, and then also staying on the basketball, we'll talk more about this with Alec when he gets on, but, uh, Alec Griffin from Syracuse expected to be the easily named assistant coach for Archie Miller. Cause he had, uh, hired him at Dayton, but he's going to stay at Syracuse. So, uh, the, the position for assistant coach still open, uh, on the market, Archie will still be looking to fill that. Yeah. And I mean, I, uh, it's the one that on paper kind of seemed like it made some sense, but I didn't know anything about the relationship. I don't, you know, I, I didn't have any inside information as to, it just seemed to make sense on paper, but that's not, I don't think it's a huge loss. I don't necessarily know that it wouldn't have been a great hire. I, I don't know. Romeo got, uh, not only getting the game, he played a career high 30 minutes. Um, I think that was against the Washington wizards. As a matter of fact, he ended up with six points. He's not a big scorer, six and four. He's turned uh, into more of a defense, more of a defensive guy, to be honest with you. And they'll take that. Anybody, anytime they sure. can get that in the NBA, they'll take that. Thomas Bryant, how about him continuing on? He's becoming an NBA big man. He oh, had yeah. 26 and nine, four steals and two blocks in their 96 90 win last night. Uh, he's becoming a man. He's becoming an NBA big man. Well, I don't know when his contract is up. I he just signed what, a nice fatty last year, but I don't know how long it was because I think it's he's just one a of those years. If it is, it's he's going to be a year, loving a year life too long. Yeah, because well, he's if he one can play this, guys, if he can do this one more year, oh yeah, for sure. But I mean, he's one of those guys that you'll see. You know, I use him as an example, but you'll see like a LeBron James saying he wants to play with Anthony Davis. I mean, Thomas Bryant. I, I, people would laugh for me saying I'm putting him in Anthony Davis's category, but I mean, I'm just putting the idea of him being a complimentary big man that, uh, that can really help out a team. And, and I could see him definitely being a sought after guy. I mean, he's just putting up numbers game after game. Yeah, you, he's getting there, man. When you put those kind of numbers up, it tells a story for sure. But how about Romeo playing 30 minutes? That's that's quite a departure from from the norm. Yeah, did, did you see like Gordon Hayward didn't play at all? Tatum didn't play at all. Marcus Smart did didn't play at all. Yeah, I mean that those guys they're sitting out. They're resting. You know they played an eight game finish to the regular season, and you knew this was going to happen. But the, in this this is the second week, and you knew in that second week they were going to sit guys out and rest. Help! They started resting guys last week. LeBron rested one game last week, so it's load management. Yeah, load management. Ask, we need to get Archie on and ask him about load management. Yeah. He loves load management. Uh, let's see, spring football. I, I, I really don't know if I'm if I think it's going to happen. If I don't think because initially, after seeing Urban Meyer say no chance, uh, seeing Tom Allen's initial response on a Zoom call, but now seeing all these other people. Ryan Day, or Scott Frost at Nebraska, they are definitely pushing. And then you have Jeff Brom, who came out with a serious proposal yesterday of a spring football schedule. It would not – it would basically eliminate the Big Ten teams from playing in bowl games and that, but it would be tied to next year. Next year's schedule would kind of be like this. This year's was going to be, but it would get eight games in, in the conference games in the spring. I just don't know the likelihood of it, but man, they're serious about trying to make it happen, Todd Larry. Uh, these coaches are they, they want to play. Yeah, and I and I said this yesterday. They they have to do that. They have to be that way. Yes, I'm sure they do want to play. I, I get that. But from a motivating your players standpoint, they don't really have a choice. Like they they have to say, we'll do anything to play. They've got kids that they have put a lot of time and effort into, you know, helping develop and get better. Um, these players have put a lot of time and effort. They want their coaching staff to to be 100% supportive and behind them. And 
I mean, I, I'm not saying these coaches are, are being disingenuous. I'm just, I'm just saying they don't have a choice. Like they all have to handle it that way. Yeah. So, so they go, so they go. But uh, I, I think that there's going to be, this is going to be taken very seriously. Now I think it was not prior to uh, when you got coaches that are taking their time to try to come up with a schedule. And I'll be honest with you. I think a lot of people are miffed. A lot of coaches are miffed at the big 10. They don't yeah. feel like that they had any plan where these coaches are coming out with alternative plans. The big 10 is nothing. Here's the first thing that went through my mind. And I don't, this, I don't know that this happened, but this is the first thing that went through my mind. When he put that schedule out, I felt like it was him thumbing his nose at the Big Ten going, hey, I sat down for 20 minutes and put this plan together, <laughs> put this plan together how we can make this work in the spring. You know, how about, how about you put a room full of smart people in there and, and spend a couple days, you know, hammering this thing out, it's figured out. Well, maybe that's the problem. That's what they've been doing, and this is where we are, unfortunately. So maybe they don't. Maybe they just let somebody like Jeff Brom just do it on their own and, and, and deal with it. But uh, it, it's definitely going to be something that that Ryan Day and Scott Frost and these coaches and the rest of them, I'd say, would be pushing for. But we've heard so many times, and, and Urban Meyer was the one most recently to say, you can't ask them to play twice inside of a calendar year. Uh, and I know some people may say, well, why does that matter? It's not the date per se, but it's the wear and the tear on the body. Football season just produces uh, injuries, man. A lot of injuries and injuries that usually take some that take six months to recover from. Some how, long, these guys, how long is it when they, when they have spring practice? I'm asking this because I don't know. How long is spring practice? Probably the whole thing probably lasts a, a month, month, maybe. A month? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, because I was trying to analyze that versus spring practice versus, you know, them going for two and a half months. Because that's that's in the same calendar year, but it's so much shorter and they're not killing each other like, like no they games. would in a, in a game. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, it's just I, the part of it where I think they fight an uphill about This is why I say the coaches have to take the stance they're taking, even though I'm not sure they're all totally feel as strong about it as they say they do. Because – you, you're going to have an entire I – mean, you got six rounds worth of draft picks that are going to be juniors, to be juniors and seniors, that if we were playing spring football, can they honestly say that these kids would be making a good decision to play a spring football season and then turn around and try to show up for a mini camp in the NFL in June or July? I wouldn't play if I was a kid that was going to get drafted. And a lot of those guys probably won't. A lot of those guys have opted out already. Ron sure. Moore, uh, sure. the kid from Minnesota, they're already. And that list will be that list will be hundreds of kids. It won't be it won't be a list of a dozen or two dozen kids. It'll be hundreds of kids that will opt out, and you can't blame them for that. No, but I sure like to see it. I don't I'm mind. With you. I don't with mind. You. Um, golly. Just really want to see this team play. I, I, I want to see these guys get to play. I want to see the guys like Wap Fillier get to play. Um, Peyton Ramsey up at Northwestern, you know, such a great kid. And uh, if gets, you're if you're a kid in his situation, you transferred up there. You're already you've already graduated. You're a grad student. I mean, you. This is one of two things. This he's is getting a free un- education. He's great. It's either an unbelievable <laughs> opportunity. He's going to get two years of grad school, so he's going to finish grad school basically for free. For free. Or you can look at it from the standpoint of, hey, you know what? I think he he talked about wanting to get into coaching. You know, this is a year that's going to delay that ability to get into coaching and start that the professional career. And here's the thing: you talk about all these people talking about the players. Oh, they don't they don't get they don't get paid. They, they, you think Peyton Ramsey's complaining about not getting paid? He's going to get six years of free education, and that's the majority of these kids get that and use that. The majority do not go on to become pros. Uh, so, you know, when you continue to say that they're not getting paid, well, uh, how much is the education that Peyton Ramsey's going to leave college with going to be worth? And will he put it to use? Absolutely, he will. Uh, I've got I've got a degree from Indiana and a graduate degree from Northwestern. Yeah, I'd say he's set. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he's in pretty good shape. Hey, we got to take a break. Dana Bimbo from the Indian Star is going to join us next. You're listening to Indiana, Indiana Sports Beat Radio coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios. We're back with more right after this. Wednesday to Thursday, I don't care about you. It's Friday, I'm in love. Hello, 
everybody. Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Beat. When I'm not covering the Hoosiers, you can find me at Bubba's 33 in Clarksville, located on the northeast corner of I-65 at Veterans Parkway. Bubba's 33 has hand-tossed pizzas, bold burgers, and ice-cold beer from a select list of local craft brewers. An incredible food selection, all made fresh daily. Whether you're meeting the team for that post-win meal in the family dining area or meeting friends for happy hour to watch the game on one of Bubba's 50 TVs, Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Pizza, burgers, beer. We all want a winning smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you will get at Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Reynolds Family Dentistry has been serving the dental needs of Hoosier families for over 30 years. Let Drs. Roger and Jay Reynolds take care of your family. Just off of I-65 at 809 South Indiana Avenue in Sellersburg. Call 812-246-3368. That's Reynolds Family Dentistry, 812-246-3368. Now that warm weather has arrived, it's time to hit the links, and there's no better place than the golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. Voted best golf course by the readers of the Bloomington Herald Times, the golf club at Eagle Point is under new ownership, has new fairways and bunkers, and it's open to the public. When the round's over, there's cold beer and a full menu at the Eagle Point Pub and Bistro. Call 812-824-1100 to make a tea time. That's 812-824-1100. The golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. This is Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Beat with Coyle and Leary. Indiana Sports Beat is now a part of the Rivals Network. You can go to thehoosier.com to sign up. It's free. Catch the show there each day live or at your convenience. You can also like or follow us on Facebook, follow the show's rebroadcast, anywhere you podcast. If we're not on a radio station where you live, we should be. Let your local station know they need to carry Indiana Sports Beat with Coyle and Leary or simply go to thehoosier.com. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic, safe, effective, even money-saving, just like FDA-approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit fda.gov slash generic drugs. Generics are safe, effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. This is former Indiana basketball player Brian Evans, and you're listening to Indiana Sports Beat with Jim Coyle. Today's guest is brought to you by Reynolds Family Dentistry of Sellersburg. You need a million-dollar smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you'll get with Reynolds Family Dentistry. Everybody circling as vultures, negative, nepotist. Everybody waiting for the fall of Maine. Everybody praying. Welcome for back to Indiana time. Sports Beat, coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios, of course, on this Friday at August 14th. Joined now by Dana Bimbo from Indianapolis Star. Happy to have her along again. Thank you so much for joining us, Dana. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, always a pleasure. Uh, Todd here with us as well. Uh, so, how have you been spending your uh, quarantine time? Not quarantine time, but just uh, the pandemic time. It's uh, certainly been a life changing a deal for all of us. Yeah, like, well, at first they pulled some of the sports writers off of sports, obviously, in the beginning, because there were none. And uh, so I ended up covering the story of Chase and Sadie. I don't know if you guys have been following it, but he was like a elite swimmer. He's 19. He found out he had three to five months to live, and his high school sweetheart and him got married their senior year in April. Um and so he's uh, past three months, and so he's kind of sick, right? He's pretty sick right now, but um, he got to find his love of his life, and it's kind of been a touching story to follow. That's, that's what I did in the early part. Dana, I read that article. It was It's a tearjerker. Like, I don't know if that's what you were going for, but... Man, it was uh, what a story that was, and or is I should I guess I shouldn't say it in past tense. That's an unbelievable story, and um, you know it, it's just it, it is a sports story. I mean, I know you said they took you off sports, but I mean it's it's a sports related story, and and I have uh, I have enjoyed continuing to follow. Uh, you know, even after that one, I, I read the Art Schleister story that you just had come out, and and there's just a lot of really interesting stuff for you to cover right now. But it's it's not actual games, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, so I was set to go visit Art Schleister, you know, the 
So he was the, for like young people who may not know, he was the number four, you know, overall NFL draft pick in 82 when the Colts were still in Baltimore. And he was this great player at Ohio State and quarterback and expected to be this amazing NFL star. And so uh, he's now in federal prison. He's been, in the past 40 years, he's been in 60 different prisons and jails due to gambling. And How many? So, um, 60. 6 zero. So between all the jails and prisons he's been in, he's been in 60. And he's had two 10-year federal sentences, and he's getting ready to finish his second federal sentence. And so he's 60 years old now, has Parkinson's and dementia, and he agreed, like, in January, we started corresponding via email, and he said I could come out to Colorado, visit him in prison, and I was going to do a big piece as he was said to be released, but then, of course, COVID happened, and they weren't allowing visitors, so we did all of our interview by email, and he's this, he's, I mean, he's fascinating, he's very sick. He's still gambling in prison. In fact, as we were emailing, he got disciplined and couldn't write me because he was telling people in prison that he had Super Bowl tickets and they were getting their family members to send him money and he has no Super Bowl tickets. Um, but then he was having women outside the bars play bets for him with that money that he was getting from people in prison. So... I went to Ohio last week where there was some court hearings and the judge was like, they were trying to, you know, get him out of prison early. His attorneys were, and the judge was like, no, this guy's in prison, still gambling, still like swindling people. So, and he's just, he's insanely addicted. That's just a, uh, it's just a heartbreaking story because you can tell the guy is just, uh, he can't control himself, and and if you are someone who does remember that name, I do. I mean, that especially that was in my childhood, my teenage years. I mean, that was one of those guys, those big time people you looked up to, and it's just it's so sad to hear that, and 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 knowing that uh, after all this time, that if he he could do anything, that he would, uh, if he could do it differently. So obviously, you can tell it's it's just a sad, sad story for him. So did did you actually get to communicate? You said you were emailing, like you, were you guys actually corresponding back and forth? Oh, yeah, we corresponded for, like, three months, and then um, he got banned, and then he corresponded a little bit more when he got his email back, and then I wrote a story um, about him gambling in prison, because in my research, I found that out, and I found the hearing was going to happen, and when I wrote that story, I got a letter from the prison, and it said, Arch Leister has banned you from talking to him again or whatever like he wasn't going to receive any more stuff from me so he was upset that I guess that I had written that but the prosecutor told me that he read all of his prison emails and that after I wrote that story he was telling people that he had been hoping he could get me to play best for him so like he was being really nice when he was talking to me in the email he never asked me to play for that but the, the prosecutor said that was his intention was to try to see what he could, you know, get out of me. Crazy. I mean, when, when you, like, I remember reading the story, and I don't want to lump them together, but just they're both football players. So when you read the story about Ryan Leaf and guys that have have been in that situation, like the uh, Ryan Leaf, I, I, I think, blamed most everything on being addicted to drugs and being, you know, he did, he stole money to get drugs. Did Arch Leister say any of that kind of stuff, or was it all just gambling addiction? No, he now he specifically wrote to me about tragedies in his life, and so I read all of his books as well before I wrote the article. Um, and he did have some tragedy, like when he his dad owned this huge farm in Ohio, and uh, when he was a little boy, he was out playing, and he walked in, and one of the farm hands was hanging, hanging like from the barn like he had hung himself and so Art said that that never got out of his mind and then um, he had a severe like he almost died from a fire his brother and him were mixing gas with flames or something and he had severe burns and he didn't think he was going to make it and in the hospital I think he was about 12 years old maybe um, he told his dad you know I just want to die because the pain was so bad and so I talked to his psychiatrist who said, 
that he definitely had tragedy in his life and a lot of times you know that can cause an addiction like that but his wife i don't know if you heard this story but she told us that or his ex-wife when she was pregnant with their first daughter in the hospital she took off her jewelry and laid it aside um and was like getting ready to give birth and he took her wedding ring sleepster did and pa- like left the hospital pawned to get money placed bed and then came back for the birth of their daughter so he just <laughs> really 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 sick i mean it's it's just crazy that he's still doing it from prison you know that yeah, shows you the sickness. It, it, I, I'm it just does. sitting here shaking my head half the time. I chuckled. You. I chuckled, and then I thought, "Wait a minute, this is this is not funny." Like I'm not chuckling because it's funny. I I was thinking about what your wife is like when she's giving birth, and and the <laughs> the craziness that's going through her mind at that point. I can I can only imagine what he brought upon himself with that. That's just that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you you hear these kind of stories, but. You never think that they can really be real, and and but this the sickness that it has to overcome, and, and but then you got to feel for the family because you just mentioned the wife and there's kids, and that's the sad part of this. Well, his dad ultimately ended up taking his life by suicide in two thousand. I can't remember which year. It was a decade, more than a decade ago, because he had been like they had been like giving their life savings to try to just legal fees with him and trying to get him, you know, treatment. And his dad finally um, wrote, like, wrote a note in Ohio and jumped into the pool they had on the deep end. I guess he doesn't even know how to swim, and he drowned himself. And he was just like, he had, I mean, he had done everything he could for his son. And, it's, I mean, it's a tr- it really is a tragic story. He, it's very tragic. But then again, you think, I mean, I guess the guy I talked to said like less than 3% of compulsive gamblers ever actually recover. Unlike alcoholism or, you know, drug use, you, you get a lot of recoveries and people stick to the, stick to being sober. It's very hard for a compulsive gambler to ever recover. And I'm not sure exactly why. I'm thinking Dude, I read I read I read the article about the seven hundred thousand dollars settlement he got from the NFL over the CTE um, you know issues and like is that is that a is that a settlement he got a long time ago is that sitting in his bank account when he gets out like because you know that that'll get gambled the second he gets out of there if this is the case yeah the the prosecutor in Franklin County Ohio is awesome he's he's got to be close to eight I mean he's been doing this a long time and so he's he just thinks Schleister should get nothing so he filed motions to have that money go to his victims versus him when he gets out of prison so yeah it's sitting somewhere uh a court just ruled that over a million or let me think 150,000 of it goes to um one of Schleister's victims Anita Barney who then has to pay her victims because Anita Barney was the widow of a Wendy's fast food restaurant CEO. He was the CEO of Wendy's and she was his widow or ex-wife, I can't remember. And Schleister knew she had money, so he started having her place best for him. Um, And this was years ago. And then once she did that, he started having her get her friends to get her money so she ended up being a, a major accomplice of Arch Schleister. And so the money from the $700,000 that was supposed to go to her, a poor rule, she gets it as a victim, but then she has to pay it out to her victim. So it's like, and so he has a 500 some less, but I think my guess is that those are going to be spread among his, you know, hundreds of people he swindled. I was shocked more by the $700,000 amount he got from the NFL. I mean, that's... That's a big amount. Oh, and that's what I'm, I need to look into that because I was like, yeah, I mean, maybe is it due to his dementia that he's claiming it's from CPE? I mean, I don't know how that all works. Like, how do they decide who gets what? Right. Like, I don't even know. Well, you know, things are bad when your victims have victims. When your victims, yeah. I'm sure. like, wow. I, 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 
I have been obsessed with this story. I'm just like, I cannot believe, you know, like when the NFL banned him, he was in Baltimore, the NFL banned him, Commissioner Roselle at the time, and said, like, this guy's sick, he's out, because he had gotten drafted by the Baltimore Colts, and the first thing he did, I guess, was look up all the Baltimore bookies and started placing bets in Baltimore. And when he was banned, um, he got sent to a treatment facility in New York. And while there, and this was inpatient, required, can't leave. While there, his mentor that I talked to said he was sitting there visiting him, and a limo pulls up, and they're like, yeah, Schleister needs to go work out. And he was like, what? You don't get to leave the treatment facility. And they're like, yeah, somehow he got where a limo comes and picks him up every day, and he goes and works out. And so the mentor was like, you just can see how no matter what avenue in his life, he could get people to do, you know, what he needed to have done for him. Yeah, that's the remarkable thing. Uh, People think that, and they are, they're sick, but... They're also geniuses a lot of times. The, the, the mental capacity is mind-boggling that they are able to get done, like you just talked about. He had a wife. I mean, he had he's had, and he continues to get people to do things or, or gets close to it. That that's that takes some genius. And there's a lot of intelligence in there. Yeah, he's incredible. So he's set to be released in like nine months from Ohio prison. They're going to transfer him from Colorado this month to finish out his state sentence. And so I guess I'll keep following, you know, what ends up happening with him. Um, But yeah, that's been my big, big chunk of time. Of course, now it's like 500 stuff. So what are you guys, are you guys having like a big watch party for the 500? Or do you... you Yep, yep. Uh, everyone, everyone's invited. We're getting we're planning on having hundreds of people. No masks allowed. Yeah, we're we're gonna have yeah. a big blowout. Yeah, we're just hoping for something to sports just every day. We're just like, okay, what are we gonna do today? Uh, but no, I'm looking forward to the. Are you gonna? Are you going to the race? Yeah, I'm doing a piece on uh, what it's like being there without fans, I guess. Like, so I'll be, like, inside and just, I guess, what is kind of just a feature type piece on what it's like being there without fans. So that's my assignment. Before that, I I put a call out for people whose streaks have been broken. I cannot believe the stories I'm getting in of these people and their streaks of going to the Indy 500. Um, the longest one right now is 75 years. This Holy cow. Going. I know. Another one is a woman who, I think it was 12 years, but two of the years she came while undergoing radiation treatment for breast cancer and was really, really sick, but she didn't want to break her streak. And so that's a cool story. Um, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of stuff coming out. I've gotten like 300 responses, and I'm going to have a hard time picking. But is there like I guess this is just the soft side of me wondering like is there any way Roger Penske or anybody comes up with that? I mean I guess people would just start making stories up if that was the case but is there any way they get like special passes for people that can prove they've been to the race for 75 years in a row I know because you know what that is a great idea because the guy who's been one of the guys who's been like 67 in a row he sent me a picture and he has these boards with every single ticket. So he saves every single ticket. So he can definitely prove it. And Man. I'm sure there's other people like that. Let's start a campaign. Get that done. You got the, the, that place is you, so massively if you can big. Prove you've been to, if you can prove you've been to more than 25 in a row, just send your information in and Dana will get you a ticket. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> there you go, Dana. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be funny. That is a good idea, though, for the person who's the longest running. Like, let that person and, like, four or five family members come watch the race. Man, looking forward to it. Looking forward to the race, too. Dana, I cannot thank you enough. The story is riveting. Make sure you follow her at the Indianapolis Star because she's got nothing but great content. Uh, we look forward to the end story. We'll look forward to following up to see if you can get anything done for those special ticket people. That would be awesome. <laughs> Now the pressure's on you. Now you have the pressure on you. You thought you had an easy Friday. You're welcome. (laughs) 
Alright, well, you guys have a good weekend. Thank you, Dana. Dana Van joining us from Indianapolis Star. Couldn't be happier. Coming up next, Alec Lasley from the Hoosiers is going to join us. Got to talk about some Indiana basketball. Stay tuned. Listening to Indiana Sports Beat coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios. Back with more right after this. Hello, everybody. Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Beat. When I'm not covering the Hoosiers, you can find me at Bubba's 33 in Clarksville, located on the northeast corner of I-65 at Veterans Parkway. Bubba's 33 has hand-tossed pizzas, bold burgers, and ice-cold beer from a select list of local craft brewers. An incredible food selection, all made fresh daily. Whether you're meeting the team for that post-win meal in the family dining area or meeting friends for happy hour to watch the game on one of Bubba's 50 TVs, Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Pizza, burgers, beer. We all want a winning smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you will get at Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Reynolds Family Dentistry has been serving the dental needs of Hoosier families for over 30 years. Let Drs. Roger and Jay Reynolds take care of your family. Just off of I-65 at 809 South Indiana Avenue in Sellersburg. Call 812-246-3368. That's Reynolds Family Dentistry, 812-246-3368. Now that warm weather has arrived, it's time to hit the links, and there's no better place than the golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. Voted best golf course by the readers of the Bloomington Herald Times, the golf club at Eagle Point is under new ownership, has new fairways and bunkers, and it's open to the public. When the round's over, there's cold beer and a full menu at the Eagle Point Club and Bistro. Call 812-824-1100 to make a tea time. That's 812-824-1100. The golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. This is Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Beat with Coyle and Leary. Indiana Sports Beat is now a part of the Rivals Network. You can go to thehoosier.com to sign up. It's free. Catch the show there each day live or at your convenience. You can also like or follow us on Facebook, follow the show's rebroadcast anywhere you podcast. If we're not on a radio station where you live, we should be. Let your local station know they need to carry Indiana Sports Beat with Coyle and Leary or simply go to thehoosier.com. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic, safe, effective, even money-saving, just like FDA-approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit fda.gov slash generic drugs. Generics are safe, effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. This is James Blackman Jr., former Indiana Hoosier. Make sure you're keeping up with the Hoosiers on Indiana Sports Beat. Today's guest is brought to you by Reynolds Family Dentistry of Sellersburg. You need a million dollar smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you'll get with Reynolds Family Dentistry. Turn all of the lights on. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat. Of course, coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios on this Friday. It's August 14th. Joined now by Alec Lasley of thehoosier.com. A lot of news uh, for Indiana basketball, Alec. Uh, recruiting information. We've got uh, NCAA putting, uh, again, extending the dead period through October 1st. Uh, so no visits. And that lays into one of the targets that uh, you, you actually got to speak with, it looks like. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, I know the the big news over the last week on the basketball front was, you know, Bryce Hopkins decommitting from Louisville, uh, former Indiana target in the class of 2021. Uh, Actually visited Indiana last year before he ultimately committed to Louisville. But yeah, he had a Zoom call with with Indiana last night, uh, just kind of a refresher uh, from the from the original visit. But he said things are going really good with with IU as it currently stands. That's a, and ironically, there's three guys they have that basically all have the same position that are the top targets for this uh, recruiting class right now with Trey, uh, Trey Kaufman, obviously. And you add in Mason Miller to that. These guys all play the same position. I don't see Indiana getting three of those guys. I can see him getting two of them. Um, but, and with the, the NCAA extending the recruiting dead period, you just mentioned that he's already, he did have the opportunity to come visit. I'm not sure if that will make any difference. But uh, the recruiting is coming down to the same position right now. 
Yeah, I mean, one thing with Hopkins is he he does have a little bit more versatility to play a lot more on the perimeter, uh, either as a kind of a much bigger perimeter player um, or if he does have kind of that mismatch, take take his smaller opponent down to the post, uh, which he does often. So I think if you're looking at that that kind of group of three, the the two that really have the the different kind of skill sets that would mesh well together are Trey Kaufman and, and Bryce Hopkins. Um, Mason Miller, obviously really talented player, but just isn't as fundamentally sound or, or at least as motivated to play in the post as maybe the other two are. Uh, so if you're going to go with that, obviously we know, you know, I use front court is a, is a bit thin in the coming years here. Uh, so you do need someone obviously to be able to, to play in the post. And that's kind of where uh, that, that skill set would be lacking if, if Mason Miller came with, with Bryce Hopkins. With the uh, NCAA extending the recruiting dead period and with him already, with, with he, he had the opportunity to make a visit. You, do you think his recruiting is going to go faster that he's going to just get this kind of over with? Yeah. I mean, I mean, one thing that obviously is definitely going to help him out is he was tied, you know, already at IU. And I think you're, you're going to see that obviously uh, Oregon, uh, Notre Dame and Providence are three schools who just offered uh, Bryce Hopkins here in the last week. Uh, hasn't obviously been able to get out to any of those schools. Uh, you know, we talked last week about how, you know, depending on the, the recruit, how vital it is to actually get to a campus. So the fact that he already has that relationship with Archie Miller, with the staff, uh, and, you know, was on campus to, to see that, I think it, it is going to set Indiana apart uh, in the initial stages here. And I don't really see this recruitment going super, super long. Um, I, you know, I see a couple schools kind of maybe asserting themselves here in the next week uh, to really stand out. And I think Indiana will be one of them um, just because of that that already, you know, fundamentally sound relationship that they do have and the, the ability for him to already be on campus and see what the, what the school is like. Well, I'm a little surprised that Illinois – has not made better inroads into his recruiting because they, they've really picked up and, and been pretty successful recruiting here the last year or two. And he's from Illinois. And when you say those three schools that offered him, is Indiana considered to have offered him or is it just those three schools right now? So Indiana offered him back last year before, right. uh, before the, you know, before he ultimately committed, they're, they're still honoring that, that offer. Uh, so it's one thing where, you know, Kentucky's another school that, that is, that has hopped in here, but hasn't offered him yet. Um, so it, it's going to be interesting to see kind of wh- which of these offers really kind of stands more, um, than, than some of the, the new ones that have popped up. But yeah, Indiana obviously has, has that relationship from, from back then. Uh, obviously another one of those schools that you just mentioned, Illinois, the, the main thing with them, they, they just have a lot of lot of youth on that roster and not a lot of scholarship space coming up um obviously you know you have a a couple guys coming back uh this year that that'll most likely be gone after after this year so we'll free up some space but they still have a lot of you know two three year players that that are going to be there for two or three years that play a lot of the same position that he does um so obviously they're they're interested uh obviously they're going to remain interested i just don't know how how effective that that roster space is is going to be in terms of kind of swaying swaying him one way or the other. But obviously, being that kind of homeschool, uh, obviously is going to play you know a large a large role in in this as we as we kind of move forward here. Is it true he had a, a close tie with Blake Wesley? They do have a similar trainer. Uh, they haven't trained together a whole lot, but I, I've been told that they, they do have a, a, a decent relationship. I don't know if I would say a great relationship. Yeah. Those um, things get blown out of proportion all the time. That's why I never really believe yeah. them unless I hear it out of the kid's mouth. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they do know each other obviously from, from playing together a little bit and having the same trainer, but I don't know necessarily how, how well the, the two of them mesh together. It's not a package deal. Yeah, no, I, I would not consider it a package deal. As far as assistant position, Archie Miller still looking to fill that. I like uh, Alan Griffin, who was expected to kind of easily uh, just be named that because uh, he had been hired by Archie before at Dayton. But uh, he decides to stay at Syracuse, so that position is still open and now uh, goes back out. And, of course, everybody will be throwing names out there again. And we'll hear all the IU former IU players and people yep. will be throwing out and all that. But it's not – I can promise you I will be shocked, shocked if it was an IU former IU player. Oh yeah, I mean, if you you look at the former IU players. There's not a lot with a ton of coaching experience, and this is a job that 
they're looking for a lot of that, that not only coaching experience, but recruiting experience. Uh, obviously, you know, Bridger Flint had a decent amount of connections out, out on the East coast. Uh, so that's kind of one area that they're, they're looking to, to really kind of get a little bit more of a, of a guy who has some of those connections out here and in kind of the Southeast. Um, you know, I, I don't really know how, how long this is going to take. I don't think it's going to take super long. I think, you know, Archie Miller knew that if that UK, uh, spot opened up, Bruiser Flint was going to be gone. So I'm pretty sure he, he knew this was coming eventually and, and pretty much already had a short list of guys. I mean, there were, there were a group of guys already that, that kind of came out in the first day or two that, that people kind of <laughs> already knew about. Um, but I don't think this is going to be something that, that goes on for a super long time just because obviously summer is slowly coming to an end and, and practice is going to gear up here eventually. Uh, and obviously there, there's still some decent targets out there that they need, uh, you know, a recruiter for. So uh, I, I would expect this to kind of ramp up uh, and, and kind of finish up in the next couple of weeks here. Yeah, because even though it, there's a lot, of, a lot of uncertainty, basketball season will be upon us quickly, and and the recruiting is still ongoing. Any chance that that this coach is tied to any particular person that they're recruiting currently? Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily think so. I, I, you know, I think this is this is going to be more of a of a feel for not not so much these recruits, but the recruits moving forward and, and starting to kind of build that relationship more with the 2022 class. Uh, you know, Archie Miller already ha- has built a great amount of relationships with this 2021 class. And uh, just because, you know, maybe Bruiser Flint, who was the lead on Aminu Muhammad and Blake Wesley, uh, just because he's, he's gone, um, you know, it's not to say that, that Archie Miller really hasn't been the lead uh, on those two, because obviously that the head coach is going to have the last say in everything. And the head coach is going to be the one that that is really going to need to have the best relationship with not just the recruit, but with the family. Uh, and, and obviously they've, they've made significant grounds with, uh, I mean, Muhammad and, and Blake Wesley still that name there that I don't think him leaving is really going to impact too much from the 2021 class. Well, it's certainly going to uh, bring more excitement as it uh, gives us something to look forward to and, and, and the hope for basketball. And I think that what we've seen out of football, Alec, is, is that basketball knows they have to do any and everything possible to not go through the debacle uh, that we just saw with the Big Ten football. One of the things that came up, though, was the possibility of them using a bubble at some, in some form. And, and they, they, the, and that was from the vice president of the uh, NCAA. And while he acknowledged that it's not – viable for the entire season that it's something that is very possible to use uh it, to get the season through as, as as a piece of the season yeah and i think if you look at it obviously we saw the pac-12 uh even for basketball get rid of all the non-conference games and cancel those up through the end of uh, 2020 I, I really think you're going to see a lot of just conference only uh schedules here in basketball and i think you can easily I don't want to say easily, but you can definitely make it much more uh, viable in a, in a bubble type situation. If you go conference only, you know, we see it all the times with, you know, the conference tournaments. Um, and, and one thing that, that you can look at just like a timeline at this is let's say you push the season back to, to make it start maybe a week or two later uh, after Thanksgiving, where, you know, the majority of these teams have a couple of games leading up to that, but, uh, for the most part, you're you're maybe maybe getting rid of two or three weeks of the season, but you start right after Thanksgiving when all the students now are are going to be doing online classes and, and kind of staying more at home or not going into class, uh, which a lot of these universities are saying is going to happen. And, and you play kind of a a conference tournament like atmosphere in in those kind of regions, and, and you play that up until February when when these kids come back and. And by then, maybe you have a, a week or two left, but you're, you're then going right into the, the NCAA tournament there, the, you know, the beginning of March. And, and I, I really think that that's something that could happen. Uh, it's definitely a lot more viable than, than trying to really force non-conference games here into the schedule. Yeah, they could have had the football season very easily if they would have went to some type of bubble. But they basically refused to do that because out of optics, for a looking like – these are not professional athletes. That's the whole thing is, is maintaining the look of amateurism. And it's sad that we lost an entire football season because of the, of that, because they wouldn't do that small thing yet. They can do everything else 
students are on campus and they're, they were going to practice. But I, why not take that extra step? Just, I don't understand why they can't just acknowledge that, hey, we're just, this is just an extra step to keep them safe instead of worrying about the optics of it looking like they're professional athletes. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that, that I struggle to kind of uh, wrap my mind around for, for football is how exactly they would do, you know, kind of more of that, that bubble. Obviously, you can kind of say it's a bubble with, with them being on campus um, if the kids aren't there. But it, it's just a lot more difficult with, with so many more staff and so many more team members to, to really make that. Uh, obviously, I think, I think basketball, obviously, you, you've been able to see with, uh, you know, the basketball tournament and then, um, you know, with the NBA and WNBA right now, that's, that's very feasible to do it for a basketball season. Uh, I just don't know how easy it would be for, for football um, to, to make it in some sort of, you know, quote unquote bubble. Um, so it'll, I mean, it'll be interesting. You know, I, I don't know if you guys saw the news yesterday with the ACC, some of the schools uh, canceling practice and, and some of the players saying they're not going to practice until they have, you know, more viable testing options. Um, so, you know, who knows how long the ACC is going to last. Uh, but it's definitely something where I don't think there's any right answer uh, moving forward for, for football, at least. Alec, can't thank you enough. Make sure you give him a follow at thehoosier.com on Twitter at Al Asley. Appreciate your brother. Keep it going. Doing a great job. Sounds good. Have a good weekend, guys. You too. Thanks, Alec Lasley joining us here on Indiana Sports Beat. Um, you heard it, Todd. They talked about, ah, man, I, I think I wish they would have played the stupid football season in a bubble because it would have been so easy to do. Uh, not easy, but. Yeah, so not, not easy, but, doable. but it's possible. Yeah. E- easily doable. Uh, it's, it's yeah. Feasible. So and, and it's all about the optics of, like I said, of, of, the players looking like professional athletes instead of regular students. They're not regular students. Get over it, man. They, they make money for university. I'm not on that bandwagon, that, that, that deal. It, it's just dumb that we, we lost an entire season over dumb things. I, I don't um, think it's possible. I, I mean, we talked about the fact of, you know, college football has a different, I think they've got a different battle than college basketball does in, in that, I don't know. I mean, it's feasible that they could possibly put them in a bubble, but you, you can't allow the students to remain on campus, uh, not students. You can't allow these athletes to remain on campus and then expect them to be able to go out and, and play in that. It's not a bubble at that point. Like they truly have to follow the NBA's model, um, which kind of followed and magnified the TBT, but, but they've got to go put them in a bubble scenario. They've got to take these kids and go put them for two months or two and a half months or whatever it is, and put them in an actual bubble where they have no outside contact. That's the only way I see it as, as even being possible to have this. Otherwise, if you've got what you've got in Major League Baseball, and you're going to continue to have outbreaks. They're not going to be able to have a consistent schedule. Um, you know, the NBA has proven that, that really the only way to do it is to have that full bubble. And, and I think the Big Ten basketball could easily do it. They could go – they could start January 5th or whatever they want to do run through the end of March or April and hold not just their own conference seasons, but then turn around and go straight from that bubble to the NCAA tournament bubble. But the truth is the bubble aspect wasn't really what kept, kept us from having a season. It turns out that it sounds like it's things like they just weren't prepared. They weren't prepared for testing going forward for travel testing for all these things. So I, I don't know, but obviously, you would think that they would learn from this horrific lesson uh, for basketball and, and that with the money lost now that there's, you would think that there's absolutely no way we will not have a college basketball season just because of the money lost on football. That would just, that would just wipe everything out. I would think. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I am, uh, I think you and I are both past the, the standpoint of saying there's no way this is going to happen because yeah. <laughs> we, we have trumped that 15 That's why I kept times. saying you would think. <laughs> yeah, you, it's true. I mean, you would think that they would try to do everything possible. But, um, you know, and, and so in saying so, I guess I'm saying it is feasible to, to have a, a college football bubble. But maybe it's not. You know, I, I would, you would think they would do everything possible to have some type of season, even if that included a complete bubble and, and taking the Big Ten teams and putting them all in a city and, you know, shutting half the city down and, and taking up all those hotels. And, um, 
but but I mean, maybe it's not feasible. Maybe it's not. Maybe financially, it's not possible. Because I can't yeah. imagine they wouldn't have done it. You, you, one would think, wouldn't would they? Think. <laughs> Man, it's been a, a another great week uh, as far as a great guest. We appreciate everybody so much, as always. Uh, the lifeblood of what we do here, Dana Bimbo, today. We appreciate her from the Indianapolis Star. Great. Great story. Great. And there's going to be more coming from that. And let's hope that she can get, let's hope she can find a way to get those people into the race, man. That would be incredible. That'd be cool uh, to see that. And uh, we'll look forward to that, but uh, uh, looking forward to the race coming up soon too, as well. I guess that's next weekend, I believe. So we'll, yep. so we'll be back next week to do it all over again. Make sure you uh, follow Alec Glasley at the Hoosier for complete coverage of Indiana and big 10 for uh, Jimmy, for Todd, I'm Jim Coyle until Monday. I will see you on the radio.